<coughs> Hello students. So, so far we have developed the simplest model possible from the viewpoint of uh, vibrations. We have developed the governing equation for a single degree of freedom case which involves only a, a spring and the mass. There was no damping which was considered so far. There is no external excitation also. And there happen to be some other assumptions also which are inherent to the solution process. That is, the spring happens to be massless and the mass itself happens to be, uh, it has no stiffness. Which means that we are basically talking about a discrete system. We do not have a continuous system uh, for the time being. Of course, all system happen to be continuous in reality, but uh, from the analysis point of view, it is uh, the single degree of freedom system which happen to be discrete also are the easiest one from the analysis. We have a number of numerical tools available at our disposal. Uh, of course, we will be using MATLAB for this particular purpose for the demonstration case. And uh, the other thing which is inherent for these analysis is that we are at the time being dealing with the uh, linear systems in the sense that uh, the displacement, it might be a linear displacement or the angular displacement, it is uh, very small in uh, magnitude. Okay. Of course, if you look at the stress versus strain diagram, there is a linearity range which is indicated by the elastic limit. Within this particular uh, range, the stresses or uh, force the stresses obviously can also be represented as force. They are proportional to the displacement. So we are working within this particular range of uh, linearity. Now let us bring one more component into picture which is known as damping, which basically is going to be one of the entity responsible for absorbing energy from the system. And therefore, all the vibrating body are eventually going to come into rest provided there is no external uh, source of energy. In this case, just a moment. So we have a simple uh, system on display. Uh, we still have a single degree of freedom system. But now we have a damping, which is a, a dashpot type of damping, uh, viscous damping that is, having a mm, property C, which means that, uh, just a moment, Hmm. Also see that uh, for analyzing the system, we have a coordinate frame at our disposal. Since the oscillation happens to be in a linear direction, so we are using a linear coordinate system given by x and uh, we have a positive direction also that is towards the downward direction. And uh, please note that uh, uh, the coordinate system x has been uh, located at a position of a static equilibrium. This particular distance happens to be x xt, which means that at any point of time, if we want to find out the total amount of force acting in the spring, uh, this particular spring, then it is going to be x xt plus uh, the value of x which is obviously the deformation which the mass undergoes beyond the point of static equilibrium. So this happens to be the total amount of force which is going to be uh, produced by the spring. Of course, we have seen that uh, 
some force which is produced because of static extension gets cancelled out because of the weight of the mass and uh, that particular derivation we have already done in the uh, previous slide so we need not uh, do it again but as far as the governing equation is concerned for that we draw the free body my free body diagram at uh, free body diagram the mass has been moved a distance x beyond the direct beyond the position of a static equilibrium which basically produces extension of the spring beyond the static elongation of course so in this particular figure over here we have simply located the forces indicated the forces beyond the equilibrium position as a result because the spring is getting uh, elongated further i have a spring force acting in the upper direction and similarly i have viscous forces acting in the upper direction uh, where x dot is the differential with respect to time t so i have uh, c x dot and then because the mass is moving in the downward direction i am going to uh, impose a shall I say um, imaginary force, inertia force acting in the direction opposite to the direction of motion. So this is going to bring my mass, oscillating mass in a position of a dynamic equilibrium. And then obviously I add up all these forces together to give me the uh, required differential equation of motion of course. Uh, obviously the force balance approach has been used over here. And please notice one more thing that uh, at this particular moment, I have three forces indicated by the inertia, the damping force and the stiffness force, uh, spring force that is. And all these forces, all these three forces in fact can be added up together only if there happens to be a case of uh, linearity, okay? All the forces can be superimposed only when linearity is in existence. Something like if there is like there happens to be a, can, a body, not a cantilever, it's a general body. It has some uh, elongation, it has some bending also. And let's assume that it has some amount of torsion also imposed on it. So basically it has a number of forces acting on the body. And then let me just assume that I'm trying to find the stresses or the deformation, let's say at a particular point, somewhere over here. It might be on the surface, it might be within the body that is irrespective of the uh, discussion over here, it can be located anywhere. So what basically I do is that I tend to analyze all these forces individually, one by one. So I take the axial force and then I find the displacement at this location, that is uh, answer number one, or let's say displacement number one. And uh, then I take the uh, bending effect that gives me displacement number two, and then I have the torsion that gives me displacement number three sort of thing. And then obviously I add up together. So obviously all the three displacements can be added up together only when linearity is in existence. This is how I solved my uh, cases of uh, loading when I was dealing with the elementary cases of strength of materials in my BTEC classes. This is how I do it. So we have the same thing uh, happening over here. I'm adding all the three forces together, which means that this particular case is going to be applicable only under the case of linearity. We are not going under the, in the regime of uh, nonlinear deformations. Anyhow, let me just uh, clear this thing. And please note that uh, as far as the governing equation is concerned, uh, it happens to be linear. It is a linear governing equation. This is because all the terms over here k and then c and then this particular mass are not a function of x. 
okay, they are not a function of displacement. For the time being, it has been assumed that they are independent of time also. So that also comes into picture. Anyway, they are transient also, obviously, because the displacement happens to be a function of time. Okay. And then it is a second order because I have the second order term added over here. And uh, obviously, if I require this particular equation to be solved, this particular second, equ second order equation to be solved, then I will obviously require a set of boundary conditions. This is something which we have done in the previous classes of finite element uh, also, where we were solving the case of, uh, let's say, heat transfer. So let me again talk about the same old uh, FEM or FDM analysis. I have a one dimensional body, so I have one dimensional analysis to be done. Of course, the temperatures are going to be, uh, let me just write down some part of the equation. They are going to be second order differential of space coordinate. Okay, they are the second order differential. Uh, obviously, I am writing just a part of the equation. But the thing is, I have a second order equation here also, but it is a function of space. And as you have already seen, that I'm going to require some boundary condition for the solution of this equation once again. And those boundary conditions are going to be of order less than the highest order appearing in the differential equation. The highest order happens to be two. Uh, this is that two I'm talking about. So differentials of order less than two, that is t itself and dt by dx. Uh, dt by dx basically is uh, proportional to flux and t obviously is uh, the unknown parameter. So I'm going to use the same concept illustrated over here, but then I'm going to apply this thing for the transient equation. And here I have the differentials as a function of, uh, with respect to uh, this particular time t square. So I'm going to supply the boundary conditions for x, let it be labeled as x naught. And then I'm going to supply the uh, first derivative of x. So that uh, is basically the uh, velocity at uh, time t is equal to zero. This quantity also and this particular quantity also. Both of these quantities have been supplied at the boundary of the solution. The boundary of the solution is t naught, t is equal to zero. The boundary of the solution is t is equal to zero from where the solution is going to proceed. Okay, but please notice that there is a difference in boundary conditions which have been uh, prescribed for the solution of uh, this term and for the solution of this term over here. In this case, we are supplying the boundary conditions which happen to be space dependent. They are at locations of space. And uh, this thing over here are at the starting of time, that is time t. So these boundary conditions are simply known as boundary conditions. Okay, they are simply known as boundary conditions. But these conditions over here are known as initial conditions. Initial means that they are with respect to this particular time over here. And of course, uh, just as a, just to complete this particular topic which we are doing, which we are doing, supposing if we were talking about the um, transient form of heat transfer equation, okay, transient form of heat transfer equation, let me just bring a new slide on display. Oh, let me just write it over here itself. So it is going to have a term of dt by d time plus some quantity which is going to be uh, something like k 
a del square x by uh, uh, no this is just a moment t divided by del x square okay this equation i'm talking about this is going to this particular term is going to appear when you are dealing with the transient equation of heat transfer so what i see over here is that i have a term corresponding to the uh, differential of temperature with respect to time i have this thing also and i have a term t with respect to uh, which has been differentiated with respect to space also so i will be specifying some boundary conditions for this and i will be specifying this initial conditions for this both the boundary conditions have been both uh, both type of boundary conditions are going to be required for the solution of transient heat transfer problem so transient so transient heat transfer problem basically becomes a initial boundary value problem okay initial boundary value problem this is the transient heat transfer equation which i am talking about but as far as the steady state form of heat transfer equation is concerned in which uh, we do not have this particular term we have only this term over here this is simply a boundary value problem it is simply a boundary value problem but as far as uh, this particular equation which is the governing equation we are dealing in the case of vibration for the time being is it has no differentials with respect to space x so this is simply the initial value problem we specify the boundary conditions only at time t is equal to zero so it is simply the initial value problem of course in the case when we are dealing with the uh, continuous cases we are going to use the in uh, when we are dealing with continuous cases the, the problem basically is going to be initial boundary value problem okay that we are going to cover in the uh, future topics okay then let me just clear this particular slide and uh, Oh, same slide once again and let me come to the solution portion of course to obtain the solution i will be requiring some initial values at time is equal to zero and they have been prescribed in the form of initial displacement and in the form of initial velocity okay i will be using this dot sign simply for the uh, differential and let me just uh, follow one of the popular approaches in which the solution is represented as e raised to power st where s actually uh, this s over here actually represents the uh, what shall i say the uh, solution uh, root of the solution so because the mass term is going to contain the first differential the second differential therefore i tend to find out the first and the second differential calculated over here and then i substitute these equations in uh, this particular equation over here and some equations some terms are going to cancel out which gives me this as the uh, final form and obviously you can see that this happens to be the same old quadratic equation we have been talking about and uh, we can simply find the root using the popular approach obviously we can find the exact root for this uh, quadratic equation we need not use any numerical method okay but we can simply find the roots uh, since it is a quadratic equation obviously this means that i am going to have two roots which have been indicated as s1 and s2 over here and uh, this is what the roots are going to be composed of simple enough no problems and believe me there are not going to be any problem in the future lecture also 
all this derivation is one thing which you have already done in your basic uh, mathematics classes. So, we are practically following the same line. Okay, then. Now, the thing is that we have some terms which are within the uh, under root sign and all the three things that is k, m and c are actually variables. They can actually vary. And uh, depending upon these values of uh, stiffness, mass and uh, damping, uh, we can have a range of numbers within this particular uh, under root sign. Uh, we can have a real number also, okay, uh, not real, let me say we can have a positive number within the square root, okay, or we can have 0 also, or chances are that we can have a negative number also depending upon the uh, various combinations which can exist. And the thing is that uh, the response of the vibrating body actually depends upon whether we have a positive sign within this particular under root or whether we have this particular zero or whether we have this particular negative sign over here. So accordingly the vibration phenomena is going to be uh, divided into three different categories okay and uh, those categories are being dealt in the uh, next slide. Okay, then, irrespective of whether we have a positive zero or negative sign, we basically are going to have two roots and let them be S1 and S2. So, which means that our solution now is composed of two parts and just to obtain the most general form of this solution, we are simply clubbing them. Okay, we are simply clubbing, clubbing them. We are simply uh, summing up the response of the two roots. That is the most general form of the solution which we can have. And uh, also note, that this particular clubbing is going to be possible only when the phenomena of uh, superimposition exists, which is for the linear system, which obviously is one thing about which we are uh, talking right now. But we have a solution. And then from equation number two, this is the equation of the roots which I have. I define something what is known as critical damping for which the uh, terms within the under root sign, they are actually going to be zero. So from this particular location, I turn up to this location, I use a critical damping factor for which this uh, under root sign basically becomes zero. So this is that particular condition, which obviously can be, uh, what shall I say, uh, rearranged to give me uh, this equation. So which means that the critical damping divided by twice m is nothing but it happens to be natural frequency itself. I have a square of natural frequency over m. This is one thing I have already uh, derived when I was dealing with the cases of single degree of mass uh, vibrations that were the previous lectures. And then I define a damping factor represented by eta over here, which simply is the ratio of uh, the actual damping, because C happens to be the actual damping. And this critical damping is something which I have defined for my convenience. So this is that particular eta. Uh, please note that uh, this particular CC has been defined, uh, critical damping has been defined for the case when the terms under the under root sign becomes zero. Okay, we have defined critical damping for that particular case. 
anyhow and because we have terms such as c by 2m at this particular place and at this particular place also. So, I am going to uh, derive a expression for this particular term that is c by 2m. What I do is simple manipulations that c by 2m is equal to I am simply dividing this by cc and then multiplying it by cc that is critical damping. Uh, cc by c by cc becomes uh, damping coefficient and this is one thing which is known as the uh, natural frequency this I have already derived over here. So which means that uh, c by 2m basically is can be written as the damping coefficient multiplied by natural frequency and then I substitute this particular term in uh, this expression. So, I have uh, eta multiplied by w n at this place, uh, at this place also and over here I have the square of natural frequency and then I end up with this equation. Okay. So, I have two roots once again of course, but two roots in the form of a damping coefficient and in the form of the natural frequency. The advantage is, it is very important to realize that what is the advantage which I have achieved at this particular instant. Okay. What is the advantage of writing roots in this form? compared to writing roots in this form, okay. Just a moment. Now, this particular equation, obviously for finding the roots over here, I will require three factors that is C, that is damping itself, mass also and the uh, stiffness also, that is three factors. But if I look at this end expression which I have derived over here, for finding the roots I require only two factors that is the damping coefficient over here and the natural frequency over here. This is going to, this is of some importance which might not be realized right here, but it is going to be uh, evident when we actually draw some curves. Okay, when we actually draw some curves, it is going to be evident at that particular point. For the time being, let me just uh, continue with uh, what I have. So, I have the same expression once again. Of course, I have taken this particular natural frequency outside. For clarity purpose, let me bring the previous slide on display once again. I have a natural frequency at this location and uh, of course, I can take the natural frequency out of here. So, this is what I get when I take the natural frequency out and then I start with the same derivation once again. Um, those were the classes of plus, zero and minus uh, which are going to be present within the uh, under root sign. So, when eta that is this particular term over here damping factor happens to be greater than 1, which obviously is going to be the case when the uh, actual damping happens to be more than the critical damping. And just for the information sake that this particular case of vibration is known as over damped. It is more than some particular value, value happens to be 1 over here. It is over damped system. Oh, it should have been uh, C, C at this location. Okay, now it's correct. So, when eta is more than 1, what I say is that uh, the two roots S1 and S2 both are going to be real quantities. Okay, 
when eta is more than 1 within the bracket eta square minus 1 basically is going to be a positive number and I can take the square root of that particular positive number. I can manipulate it with uh, this particular plus minus sign and it gives me two values of S1 and S2. So both of them are real. And both of them in fact happen to be negative also. Okay. Now this can be uh, this particular deduction can be concluded if you have a look over here. Okay. Uh, after taking the under root sign, what I will have is a number which is less than eta. Okay. Which is less than eta. And then I carry out this particular manipulation over here. Okay. So for first manipulation, I was using a plus sign. And I have a number over here which is less than eta. So minus eta plus a number less than eta, which obviously is going to be a negative number. And minus eta minus a number less than eta, which of course will be a negative number itself. So both these roots, S1 and S2, are going to be negative numbers. So both of them are negative. So I have these two roots kept over here. And then... Uh, obviously, they can be substituted in the general uh, equation of uh, displacement. I have a negative root over here and I have a negative root over here. And of course, when I plot this particular expression, then what I will get is a response which is going to uh, be of exponential decay. It is exponential because I have a term E over here. It is going to be a exponential decay. This is the plot which I'm going to get as a function of time and over y-axis. I have the displacement itself. And please note that uh, as far as the vibrating body, as far as the bodies are concerned, okay, as far as the vibrating system is concerned, uh, some information which was uh, conveyed in the previous lectures that uh, vibrating body are going to or let's say vibe or let's say bodies are going to be excited they are going to be placed in a state of vibration only if they have been perturbed from the um, equilibrium condition and uh, two type of uh, perturbations are possible we can perturb it with respect to the initial displacement we can perturb it with respect to the initial velocity that is uh, mathematically in form of x naught or uh, x naught dot both of them at time t is equal to 0 and of course this is the same thing which we have been talking about previously okay just in the previous slides so these are the two form of initial uh, initial conditions or the perturbations of course um, only one type of perturbation might be supplied in the sense that I may supply only the first thing and the velocity may be zero or I may supply the second thing and uh, displacement may be zero or maybe I supply both of them together. All cases are possible. And accordingly, uh, what I will get is the displacement curve which is going to be of exponential decay. This is what I have over here. Uh, since it is exponential decay, it is not a periodic system. It is not periodic. Therefore, it is aperiodic. This is aperiodic. And obviously, it is non-oscillatory. It is going to be oscillatory only if, if uh, the solution, in fact, uh, overshoots the equilibrium position and uh, oscillates with respect to this particular condition, position of uh, a static equilibrium. But that is not what is happening over here. So this is a non-oscillatory solution. It does not cross the static equilibrium. And of course, as time t increases to infinity, let's say for the sake of argument, the displacement, the entire displacement is going to die out. Okay, the entire displacement is simply going to die out. 
which simply means that uh, whatsoever was the energy in the system that has been that has been absorbed by the damper which was present in the system itself okay then we move on to the next slide just a moment now we have what is known as the uh, which is the second case in fact it is going to be a case of a critically damped for which the value of uh, the damping coefficient that is uh, this particular c over here is equal to the critically damped so this is what is a case of critically damped system for which you can do the simple manipulation this is the equation of the two roots the value of eta obviously is 1 over here so it means that when eta is 1 so this particular term is going to cancel out this obviously is 1 so which means that the two roots happen to be equal they are negative minus uh, they are negative of the natural frequency because i have a negative sign at this particular place and then of course i can combine these two roots to give me the general form of the uh, displacement equation which is something like this uh, again i have the coefficient c1 uh, raised to power first root and then coefficient c2 raised to power second root but please notice that there is a additional uh, quantity that is time which has been placed over here of course you know the mathematical uh, mathematics which is behind this so i need not go into those details and then i can carry out the uh, i can uh, take something which is common and uh, gives me the final form of the uh, displacement equation which in turn happens to be the exponential decay it is aperiodic it is uh, non oscillatory it does not crosses the static equilibrium uh, state of static equilibrium which were the in fact the same uh, observations i had for the case of overdamped system for which eta was more than 1 but uh, please notice that uh, as far as the response is concerned i can have uh, this response for let's say eta to be slightly greater than 1 and uh, this response for eta to be uh, 1 okay so all these eta to be uh, eta which are less more than 1 are going to be uh, on the upper side and uh, just for the argument's sake just for the argument's sake uh, eta that is the damping present in the system okay this is the least amount of damping present in the system for which the response is going to be non oscillatory okay this damping which is also known as critical damping is the least amount of damping which can be present in the system for which the system is going to exhibit a periodic behavior non oscillatory behavior okay if damping becomes anything less than this particular value okay if damping becomes anything less than this particular critical value the entire uh, nature of the response is going to change and of course when damping is less than critical damping eta is basically going to be less than 1 okay so that is the derivation which we are going to do in the last case 
So I have eta less than 1 which happens to be under damped. Under means less than some value, so it is under damped. And I use the same expression for finding the roots. But what I see here is that since eta is less than 1, the term under the um, under root sign happens to be a negative quantity. And uh, which means that I can introduce a complex notation i over here and reverse the order of uh, subtraction. And uh, in which case I can very well say that the roots are going to be complex conjugate. They are complex because I have a, a I sign over here that makes the roots to be composed of two parts. That is uh, the real part which in fact is present over here with a negative sign and the imaginary part which is something which is present over here. So I have the real part with a negative sign and the imaginary part over here uh, and once with a positive, once with a negative, this is what the roots to be uh, conjugate. So the roots are going to be complex conjugate. And then I can use these two roots in the same expression of uh, displacement that is equation of motion to give me the required equation. Let me just bring that slide on display. So this is the general form of the displacement equation. Uh, please uh, notice that we have mm, complex conjugate roots for S1 and S2, which we substitute over here. And then uh, please notice that uh, it has a common term minus eta at this location and at this location, which has been uh, taken out of the entire expression and uh, which gives me the value uh, inside uh, the multiplication. And then there are some steps which are actually missing over here, but uh, once uh, those are taken into account, I have the final form of the differential equation. I have this final form of the displacement equation, not differential equation, but the final form of the displacement equation. And what I see is it is composed of two parts. That is, uh, there is one term corresponding to cos, one term corresponding to n. And uh, in fact, both the terms have the same frequency over here with which the two harmonics are uh, oscillating. Okay. I have one harmonic over here also. I have another harmonic at this particular point also. In fact, because one of the harmonic is with cos, other harmonic is with respect to sine. So obviously, I can, uh, I can uh, find out that these two harmonics are at a phase gap of 90 degrees. Anyhow, this is just one of the form in which the equation can be written. I can write these two expressions in some uh, other form also. And for that, I am using a, a, a particular symbol known as WD, which is known as the damped frequency of vibration, which is present uh, at this particular place. So I'm using WD for this term which simplifies my equation over here. So I have A cos WD times T and things like that, which of course can be represented in another form. I can actually add these two terms. Okay, I can add these two terms and express the solution either in form of cos or in form of sine. Of course, in both the cases, the phase difference might be expressed in some uh, the phase difference is going to be uh, is going to be different, but still, what I see is that the solution which I get happens to be oscillatory. This is because I have oscillations over here. These are the oscillations. Okay, and because they are oscillations, they cross the static equilibrium. Something like uh, uh, they are crossing the static equilibrium and there is also present a last term which is in the 
first part of this solution, which in, in fact is going to decay as a function of time. So if I plot the two portions of this solution together, that is this particular portion indicating the exponential decay and this particular portion, the second portion which represents the uh, harmonic oscillatory component. So let me just draw the decay for the time being. So this is the decay. This is this particular expression and within which this, this particular harmonic oscillation are to be uh, drawn. So I have something what is going to be a decay of this type and ultimately the oscillations are indeed going to die out because of this particular decay. Even though the uh, solution happens to be oscillatory type, the, oscill the oscillation itself are going to die out because I have a exponential term. Okay, this particular expression term I am talking about. And of course, this means that the damper is absorbing some energy from the system. And there is of course no external excitation present. So, the vibrations ultimately die out. And then comes, a uh, let me just bring the next slide on display and then we will talk about it. The general form of the solution itself. Using initial conditions, that is at uh, x is equal to x0 at t is equal to 0, x dot is equal to 0 at t is equal to 0, we can actually find the values of uh, let's say uh, the A present over here and the B which is present at this location because we have two constants. We also have two uh, initial conditions. We can use those two initial conditions to solve this particular for to solve for this particular A and B. And uh, if we take if we take uh, uh, the initial condition in form of initial displacement, uh, we actually have the zero value of uh, velocity over here. Uh, we can find the value of A and B and uh, then we have the displacement term over here. Okay, this is simple mathematics. So we need not go into those details for the time being. That is one thing obviously which you can do, which all of you can do on your own. But uh, this has some practical applications also. Okay, this particular equation has some practical applications. So let me just uh, give the background of those, of those uh, practical applications before we actually move on to the last part of this particular presentation. Uh, the thing is uh, that we have a linear equation at our disposal. We have a linear equation at our disposal and of course we also have plenty of numerical tools which have been well established when we are uh, with uh, which have been well established with respect to the linear equations okay we have plenty of numerical tools for no solving numerical equations in fact we have a very sound foundation for obtaining analytical solutions for the linear equations also so our mathematics is very strong. We have a strong uh, foundation for solving linear numerical equations, uh, linear equations, which means that uh, whensoever we have a non-linear equation, we somehow, we tend to 
somehow make some assumptions which is going to convert the, the nonlinear equation into a linear equation, okay? Which is going to convert a nonlinear equation into a linear equation. Of course, this particular conversion from nonlinear to linear is going to be applicable only within the close vicinity of the point where the uh, point of concern. Okay. For example, let me just draw a simple curve. Okay, a simple curve. Obviously, this is a nonlinear curve. And if supposing I was talking about at I was interested at this particular point. So obviously, if I wanted the slope, uh, something, uh, let's suppose I want the slope at this particular point, I can simply draw the straight line passing through this particular point, tangent to the curve. This gives me the slope. But the thing is that this particular slope is applicable only within the close vicinity of the point itself. As I move further ahead, let me uh, let us assume that this I'm at this particular position, the slope basically is going to change. But this particular second new slope is is uh, going to be applicable within the close vicinity of the second point, and so on. So what I'm trying to say is that whenever we have a nonlinear uh, phenomena which we want to analyze, we always convert it, it uh, convert it into an equivalent linear system, but this particular conversion is going to be applicable only within the close vicinity of the uh, point of interest. Now comes the actual application. We are, are not going to, are not going to talk, talk about the damping in general, not about viscous damping, but damping in general. So we have planned, we have a number of type of damping. In fact, when a body is moving over, uh, let's say, over a surface, there obviously is friction present between the two surfaces, and uh, the friction itself is going to dampen the uh, motion. So it is one form of damping. Friction itself is one form of damping. The other form of damping is um, can be taken as uh, the slips. Okay, a slip. Uh, all of us know that. Uh, that uh, metals have uh, a particular crystal structure, BCC, FCC sort of thing. And all the uh, unit cells are in a particular plane. And whensoever the body is getting deformed, there is some amount of slip occurring between these planes. So this itself is a form of uh, friction. Basically, it is the interstitial form of uh, friction within the structure itself. And uh, the thing is that all these uh, damping, thinking whether it is friction or whether it is within the unit cells, all of them are damping. They are basically nonlinear in nature. They are basically nonlinear in nature. And obviously, because they are nonlinear, it becomes difficult to analyze the uh, analyze them. But obviously, we have a found foundation for the analysis of this particular uh, linear equation. So what we want is that we should somehow be able to convert the nonlinearity of uh, all the dampings into a equivalent damping. Okay? We somehow want all the other form of nonlinear damping to be represented into a equivalent damping, equivalent viscous damping, so that the governing equation which we have becomes a linear equation. And then we can easily solve it. This is what we want. But the thing is, how to find the equivalent damping? For that, the approximations which have been achieved over here, they are going to be of use. What we do is that uh, we simply start with the material, we excite it, and then we find its uh, oscillation sort of thing. Okay? 
uh, we can easily use uh, some sort of instrumentation to find out the uh, oscillations which are occurring as a function of time. So, uh, what we have is just a moment. What we have is going to be okay here. So, now we have excited the medium and we have uh, observed the oscillations and uh, uh, because there was no external excitation present. So, those particular oscillations of the nonlinear medium are ultimately going to down, die down. So, what we have is this particular form of curve uh, which we have obtained from the actual observations. Okay. So, this is one curve which we have from the actual observations, oscillations of the nonlinear medium. And then we come back to this expression over here, okay. this expression over here. So, this has some amount of damping, this is the frequency of damping and this is the exponential portion. So, what we do is that we come to the observations, we note point A and point B, which obviously are the extremes of the oscillations and they are placed at a distance of one time period apart. Okay? Obviously, uh, the time period itself is going to be known once you plot the actual curve, but simply by locating point number A at and point number 2 at the respective peaks. These are the peaks over here. I know that the time period is going to be from this point to this point. This is one thing which I can easily get from the, uh, from the observation. Okay, so this happens to be by time period of oscillation and this time period of oscillation can itself be used to find the uh, damped frequency of oscillation. Okay, this is one thing which I can have from the experimentation. Okay, I need not find the uh, damping coefficient right now, but I can certainly find the WD that is the damping frequency of oscillation at this particular time. And then I have some additional information also. Okay, I know from the observations what is my amplitude of vibration at XA that is XA and amplitude of oscillation at point B that is XB. So, this thing, this is one thing which I have. So, I come back to the same formula which is over here. I know the value of xA, I know the value of xB. Of course, when I was, I had xA, there is going to be TA over here and obviously TA at this point. And then when I am dealing with the um, XB, that is XB, I am going to have XB over here, or TB over here and TB over here. So, in fact, I have two equations, both equations from this particular equation itself and then I simply divide them. So, when I divide them, what I get is that this much portion is simply going to cancel out. You can very well reason it out why this is happening so, but this much of the portion is going to cancel out and only these terms are going to present, they are going to remain, which are, which have been kept in the next slide. And then of course, I can uh, shift this particular numerator term to the uh, denominator term to the numerator to find TB minus TA, which obviously is 
the difference of this particular time period. This is one thing which I have, I already have. So TB minus TA is simply uh, this particular, mm, just a moment, huh, this particular term over here, okay, it has been already found. This I substitute to give me the final form of the result and then what I do is I take the logarithmic of uh, the equation to give the final form over here. So this is log of xa by xb given by some damping coefficient. It is not damping, it is damping coefficient. And uh, since xa is x more than xb, obviously this is one thing which you can uh, make it out from the figure also. xa is more than xb, so this is basically a decrement and we are taking a logarithmic of it. So this term in the left basically represents logarithmic decrement and this value can be used to find the value of eta over here. Of course, this is a nonlinear relationship because I have the square root over here and I have the square over here also. But it has really been found that for all uh, uh, material sort of thing, eta basically approaches zero. It is a very small quantity which basically means that this denominator is going to be neglected. It can be neglected so that my value of eta, I can simply find my value of eta without any uh, complex mathematical uh, steps involved. So this was the uh, entire derivations regarding the uh, damped free oscillations, okay. By damped, free means that there is damping present. By free means that there is no external excitation, okay. If there was external excitation, I will call it damped forced excit excitations. And if damping is not present, it is undamped, okay. So damped free excitation means that damping is present but there is no external excitation, external forces absent. So I suppose everything is clear. Only relatively simple extent of mathematics is involved. In fact, only simple elementary mathematics is going to be involved throughout the entire course of vibrations. So, I don't think there is supposed to be any problem, but still if anything is not clear, do contact me and uh, that's it for the time being. Thank you.